Hey, what's up everyone? So coming at you with another PT Pearl from the Optimal Body Podcast and from our therapy table. I'm Dr. Dom. I'm Doc Jen. And we are gonna be talking to you today about FAI or femoral acetabular impingement. Ooh, that's a big clinical word. (laughs) So we're gonna dive more into what exactly that is, some of the different types, and what it means if you decide to go and have some surgery for that and what kind of outcomes look like. So we might even show you a little bit of a test that I'm gonna do on Jen to see if she tests positive for this. Yeah, so the first thing is, I mean, everyone will say, what is this pinching in the front of my hips? Or what, you know, why am I feeling this? And they might go get an image and say, oh, you have FAI or this femoral acetabular impingement, this impingement in the front of the hips. And what we kind of want to dive into is what that is first and then why it might be happening within our bodies. We have different types that are called cam lesions or pincer and all that means is a different way that the ball and the socket is kind of coming in and could be affecting the labrum so we have this thing called a labrum which lies inside of the socket so this is the acetabulum and when the socket itself kind of gets deformed or a little bit smaller that's when it can kind of start to rub and everything as you go into like flexion positions or lunging, squatting, all that kind of stuff. And it gets into what's called a pincer uh, deformity. Uh, Or we have the other one. Yeah, I like to think of the pincer. So here's your acetabulum and it's starting to have some growth maybe on one of these rims and it looks more like a pincer, like it's pinching into that femur. Yeah. The other one is a cam lesion. And so this is where the head of the femur yeah. then starts to get a little deformed and can start to rub into different places again. Um, all of them starting to develop different growths based on the pressures that they're kind of putting into the areas in that ball and socket joint um, and definitely impingement onto the labrum. So that layer inside the hip socket that kind of gets pinchy because of what's happening within the socket or within the head of the femur. Yeah, so that's where we start to get these symptoms in the front of the hips of pinching. And a lot of people will then start to complain of, oh, I get this popping in my hip when I do different squats or do different core exercises and stuff. And so how do we test? Should we show them how we test this thing? Yeah. Sweet. So I'm going to test Jen to see if she tests positive using what's called a fader test or flexion adduction internal rotation are the three things that we're going to go into in this. So I just bring her knee up, kind of put it into this flex position, and then I'm going to slowly go kind of rotate her leg out and go through this inner and you get a little uncomfortable there, Mm -hmm. huh? A little hesitation. So now I'm going to jam it way harder into (laughs) that. No, I'm not going to do that. You'll notice pretty quick if you come up into this position, you can even do it yourself. I test fairly positive sometimes on both of these if I uncontrollably push that knee into that flexion, adduction, internal rotation. And just what that's meaning is when we get into that position, we might be getting a little bit of this rubbing or this uncontrolled, you know, pushing into that extreme range of the hip, right? And so what exactly does that mean and why is that happening? This is a great little test that clinicians use just to see if we're having that clinical sign or a positive clinical test if there might be a presence of FAI. But the thing that we want to be aware of is this isn't a super specific test. So this test alone isn't what's going to help tell us, oh, you have FAI. I think one of the papers we looked at said, a good way to determine if someone has FAI is clinical signs, like positive testing like that, image, positive image um, findings, and symptoms being like you get this this pain after doing different activity and stuff. Yeah, and please don't like go just try that with your friends by like jamming, because if you don't, if you're not experienced with how to move the body, that's why it could be a little dangerous. We looked at studies as well, um, and there was one study that looked at over 2,000 hips and out of the 2,000 hips, um, 33% of this this study load was athletes. But what I like about it is that it's not all athletes because a lot of FAI yeah. studies out there are based on athletes, obviously. The way that they're positioning and moving, and we're kind of talking to that in Dom's story a little bit. But 
basically when we're looking at the when they were looking at this they could see the amount of people that were asymptomatic meaning no pain but definitely presented on the image as if they have fai and it was 37 percent had cam deformities so remember that's the head of the the femur um 67 have pincer so that means the yeah. socket had some stuff going on in there but these are asymptomatic people out of over 2,000 hips yeah and those are the studies i mean this is a study with a large volume of people relatively younger but included a lot of just general population and so the thing that we love and you're going to continue to hear us say is that the image isn't the only thing that we get to look at when it comes to diagnosing these things or figuring out how we're going to approach them. Exactly. So generally, even if we do a surgery to alleviate some short-term pain, that usually needs to be also followed up with different rehab or different movement training so that we're not continuing to put pressure in the fronts of these hips to kind of re-perpetuate that issue that we had in the first place. So as we said, we've worked with clients before who have had FAI. Um, I know in particular, I've worked with more women in this case who have had surgery and then come to me for physical therapy and are confused why they still have pain even though they had the surgery. And that's where we cannot just say that surgery is always gonna magically fix something because if you had those movement patterns that were a little bit dysfunctional or stressors that were happening in your life that you weren't addressing prior to having the surgery and then you have it and you go right back into normal everyday life, lots of stress, um, not managing things, things within your environment well and then still not addressing different movement patterns that can improve within your body of course you're still going to have pain mm -hmm. and we move through a lot of different mobility and stability type of exercises that really helped to get these women to overcome this pain and granted it could have been the time it could have been movement patterns it could have been other things but I like to think as well you were still in pain if you didn't have to have the surgery, we could have possibly worked with this prior as well mm -hmm. and created some change. Now, I do want to put out the disclaimer that for some people, the surgery does help and the surgery yeah. does fix it. So it's not that we're against surgery. We're just for getting your body looked at as a whole first. And where you say fix it, I think fix it means the symptoms have yes. gone away. Yes. And again, a lot of the studies we look at are shorter term so again is that going to last mm -hmm. and that's where what we're saying is maybe starting to look at a few different things will help it last longer and will help you balance that system around the hips so you don't continue to put the same pressures in the same places and i find that a lot with athletes specifically football hockey players people who are always in this forward crouch position using their hips a lot all of a sudden we stop working out or exercising at the end of college athletics and we lose a lot of strength and then our hips even more so just rest into that terminal range when we do different movement patterns. And so then I have people who come in and we just start going to some of the basic strength things they used to do. We balance up their core and then they notice how quickly they can get themselves out of that pain and symptom again just by giving attention to that area yeah so. I even remember um it just like came to me which I haven't thought about in a long time but I went on a really long 30 mile bike ride with mm. my family and I could barely go by the end and mm. it was was I wasn't tired I was like I feel so pathetic my little cousins are beating me right now <laughs> but it was because my hips were in so much pain and I used to get a lot of hip flexor injuries and things um, when I was a gymnast even more so that I couldn't do a split leap on one side I had to do it on the other side because my wow. hip was giving me so much pain and so even coming out of gymnastics again going on that really long bike ride I remember doing a mud run and I couldn't even lift my legs out of the mud by the end because again that hip flexion was just killing me but then I started to work on hip mobility. I know this sounds crazy, I was a gymnast, but it doesn't mean ju just because I could do splits forward and backward, I didn't have rotation in my hips. And this is mm. this is the key that unlocks the power within your <laughs> hips, like I swear. <laughs> if you actually start to address not just hip flexor stretch and not just hamstring stretch, but actually the rotation within your hips, I remember then biking for a long period of time. I was in Chicago with my friends and we were like, oh, we're gonna, take bikes around everywhere and I'm like, oh, 
okay, let's see if I could do this. Like, not sure how it was going to handle. And I was able to do it the entire way because I was working on my hips prior. And I was like, oh my God, I could bike ride the whole time. I can walk with no pain. Like, this is incredible. And it's so crazy when you actually start to implement these things. Weird, it works. And we go into this a lot in the optimal body as well. Like, the core for optimal body always starts at core one, which is the breath and how you're using that pelvic floor and that diaphragm with the transverse abdominus to actually create what you want in hip flexion. Because we don't want when that hip flexion is dominated with that hip flexor, that's where we're going to get that pinching the pain and all that other stuff. So yeah, the core one exercises are where I get my most work and start to realize, oh, this is where I need to stay when I progress core two, three, and four. And I can quickly realize when I start to fall out of that and need a, okay, let's come back to the basics and now progress again. Thanks so much guys for joining us for another PT Pearl. We hope that you learned some stuff that you actually implement this and try it in your body. Don't forget to comment below, subscribe so that you don't miss out on future videos that we have and PT Pearls and explanations. And if you have a question, drop it below. Let us know what you want to learn more of and what you're trying and opening up to now.